my talk is uh, based on uh, my recent book, Empty Cages, Facing the Challenge of Animal Rights. Uh, and I begin my talk uh, by reading from the preface uh, of that book. A few years ago, the Home Box Office Network, HBO, aired a program entitled To Love or Kill, Man vs. Animals. It told a fascinating and at the same time a disturbing story about how different cultures treat the same animals differently. One especially chilling segment took viewers to a small Chinese village uh, where they went to dinner. Uh, you know how in some restaurants patrons get to choose from among live lobsters or fish and how after they make their selection the animal is killed and the chef cooks a, a meal of their choice. At just Chinese restaurants things are the same except the menu is different. At this restaurant patrons get to select from among live cats and dogs. The video takes its time. First we see the hungry patrons expect, inspect the cats and the, the dogs. Next we see them make their selection. Finally we see a man yank a cat from the cage and hurry into the kitchen. While the cat scratches and claws, the cook hits her several times with an iron bar, clawing and screeching more now she is abruptly submerged in a tub of scalding water for about 10 seconds, once removed and while still alive. The cook skins her from head to tail in one swift pool. He then drowns the traumatized animal, uh, throwing her into a large stone bath, where, as the camera zooms in, we watch her gulp slowly with increasing difficulty, her eyes glazed until her last breath taken, she dies. When the meal is served, the diners eat heartily, offering thanks and praise to the chef. I had never been more stunned in my life. I was literally speechless. Like many Americans and of course many Greeks, I already knew that some people in China, Korea, and other countries eat cat and eat dog. The video didn't teach me any new fact about dietary customs. What was new for me, what pushed me back in my chair, was seeing how this was done, seeing the process. Watching the awful shock and suffering of the cat was devastating. I felt a mix of disbelief and anger welling up in my chest. I wanted to shout, stop it, what are you doing? Stop it! Now, I believe that my response to what I'll refer to as the cat episode is no different from the response that any of you in this room would have to that same event. Because I think we share a common core of compassion in the face of which when we see what happens to the cat, all of us would want to intervene. All of us oppose what's going on. All of us would want to help. All of us would want to stop what's being done to the cat. So we share this common core of compassion. And what's important to realize is that this is not just Americans and not just Greeks who feel this way. Increasingly what we find is that people in China and people in Korea are standing out on the streets protesting this tradition, this practice of eating cat and eating dog, as the video uh, summarized. They are opposing, they are intervening, they are helping, they are wanting to stop what's going on. Now, animal rights advocates, and I consider myself to be one, we generalize on the cat episode, if I can call, call it that. Uh, other things that are being done to animals, we want to oppose. Other things that are being done to animals, we want to intervene. Other things that are being done to animals, we want to stop. We want to help them and we want to stop their exploitation. 
And so an animal rights advocate, as properly understood as I understand the concept anyhow, is not a reformer. We're not out to try to make something better while keeping it. We're not out to try to say, oh, if only we could treat them more humanely, it'd be okay to still raise animals for fur or still raise animals to train them in the circus. We're not trying to keep the practice and reform it. What we are after is we're abolitionists. We're out to stop the various forms of human exploitation and abuse of other animals. Stop it. What are you doing? Stop it. That's what we're all about. But the question is, how do we get this way? Because what I know, what you know, is that we're in the major minority. Not all, not all the world is, 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 consists of animal rights advocates. Um, a very small percentage of us are animal rights advocates. And so you have to wonder, how did we get this way? And I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer. I don't think that there's just one way someone gets to become an animal rights advocate. I think there are at least three different explanations. And let me share them with you. One possibility that leads a person to be an animal rights advocate is what I call the Da Vincian possibility, the Da Vincians. Now we all know Leonardo da Vinci because of his famous paintings, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. What most people don't know is that Leonardo was an animal rights advocate. Now he didn't use those words because they were not part of the vernacular of his time and space, but he was in terms of his sensibilities an animal rights advocate. For example, from a very early age, as a young boy, he stopped eating meat once he realized where it came from. And he ridiculed his, his, uh, his uh, peers uh, uh, as he grew older. He said, you make of your stomach a tomb for animals. When you eat them, what do you do? You bury them in your stomach, is what you do when you eat an animal. You make of your stomach a tomb for animals, he said. In fact, Leonardo went so far as he stopped drink, drinking milk, because that was theft. He stopped eating eggs, because that was theft. He stopped all uses, all, all uh, intake of animals. He became a vegan. Now, this is a little known fact about Leonardo, but it's an absolute truth about him. And another example of his animal rights sensibility, he would go into the markets, and they had caged birds, and he would buy the birds from the, the vendor and then release them, set them free. Not larger cages for those birds, empty cages in the case of those birds. So Leonardo is a, an example of how some people become animal rights advocates. And, and the thing that's significant about the, the Da Vincians is they seem to have a natural compassion and empathy. It's, it's not something they have, you have to teach them. It's not something that they uh, is based on proof. It's not like, well, if you could prove it to me, I would respect animals, or give me your no an argument and convince me. No, no, it's not something they figure out. It's almost as if it's in their genes. It's, who, it, it's something they bring to the world, it seems. And I've known some people, and, and, and so has my wife, known some people in our lifetime who we've met as animal rights advocates who were Da Vincians. They, they just brought this sensibility to them as children. Not, didn't need to teach them, didn't need to convince them, they were just that way. Uh, 